Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of the Slavery Archive Book Club. My name is Ana Lucia Araujo. I am professor of history at Howard University. And I host the, the book club along with my co-hosts who are uh, Vanessa Holden, uh, who is an assistant professor at uh, associate professor at University of Kentucky. And also um, Alex Hill, uh, who is uh, then um, at the library at uh, Columbia University and who is also uh, a PhD um, then, uh, and, and his area is not history, it's literature, but we are converting him to, to become a historian uh, with us. Also, our fourth uh, co-host uh, who is not here today, but will uh, uh, perhaps appear during the, the meeting is Jessica Marie Johnson. She is an assistant professor at Johns Hopkins Kings University, and she is in the Department uh, of History. Now, uh, today we are going to discuss this nice book here. Then let me just show you uh, from, Gal from the Gallons to Highlands, uh, Slave Trade uh, Routes uh, in the Spanish Americas. And this is a book that is co-edited by uh, Alex Borruk, who is with us today, David Altis and Dave DeWitt, who are not here, but who are here in spirit because we will be talking about them. Um, and today the presentation, then this is a book that was published then uh, last year by University of New Mexico Press. And um, also with us, in addition to Alex, who is co-editor, is Sabrina Smith, uh, who is a contributor to the book. And she's also here and she'll be also sharing the presentation with, uh, with uh, Alex. And just before I start, I would just uh, call your attention then, first of all, to the, um, the, the bio, a, a quick bio of the, the contributors. Then Alex Borok, uh, who is uh, associate professor at the Department of History at University of California, Irvine. Um, Alex, uh, he um, completed his PhD at Emory University University and his book um, is titled, uh, then uh, his, his first book, that is his monograph, uh, is the, and it's not his first book indeed, it's his first book in English, uh, that is From Shipmates uh, to Soldiers, uh, Emerging Black Identities in Rio de la Plata. And uh, in addition to, to Alex, then we have David Altis, who is a very senior scholar who uh, is probably um, well known to all of you, who is the uh, Robert Woodruff uh, Emeritus Professor of History at Emory University. He is the author of several books, including The Rise of African Slavery in the Americas. And uh, David Altus is uh, among the, the founders of the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, to which uh, Alex uh, Baruch is also one of the um, of the, the the contributors, one of the the the, the scholars who is uh, a member of the board that keep that uh, database alive. In addition to that, we have Dave DeWitt, uh, who is the co-editor of the book as well. David is an associate professor in the Department of History of Michigan State University, and he is the author of two uh, added books. This is one, he has another co-added book uh, that was just published and his monograph is titled Atlantic Africa and the Spanish Caribbean 1570 to 1640. And this is a book published by University of North Carolina Press uh, already uh, three or four years ago. And this is a book that received uh, multiple uh, awards uh, then all these scholars, especially then Alex and David, they are uh, scholars who have been working on the Atlantic slave trade in the Spanish uh, Atlantic world. And David Altis uh, is a uh, historian of Africa who has been also working on different regions regarding the Atlantic slave trade. Now, uh, Sabrina Smith, uh, she is an assistant professor uh, of history at University of California, Merced. You are going to uh, listen her later and you know more about the work that she is doing as a scholar. Uh, other contributors um, in this book are e Emily uh, Berquist Soule, and she is an associate professor of history uh, at California State University, Long Beach. 
uh, Mark Eagle, who I believe he is here. Yes, he is. And then probably you're going to hear from him as well. Uh, Mark, she, uh, he is an associate professor of history at Western Kentucky University. Also, as contributors, we have um, Jorge Felipe Gonzalez. He's a postdoctoral fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Research Institute at Harvard University. Uh, Paul Loken, who is an associate professor of history at Bryant University. Uh, Rachel Sarah O'Toole, who is an associate professor of history at the University of California. Irving, along with uh, Alex. Also, Elena Schneider, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley. Then you see that the, the, the West Coast is very present in this book. And you have also uh, Pablo Miguel Sierra Silva, who is uh, an assistant professor of history at the University of uh, Rochester. Then I leave the floor now to, to Alex and Sabrina. I don't know who is going to start, Alex. Okay. Yes. Then, wonderful. And uh, for those of you who are on YouTube, you know that you can ask your questions and put them in the chat. Uh, those who are here on YouTube, they know how what they have to do to, to ask questions. They just have to, to raise their hands or put um, the, the questions uh, in the, the chat as well here on Zoom. Okay, folks, let's go, Alex. Great. Uh, thank you, Anna, for this opportunity to share our work, and also thanks to other people who are working with you on this initiative of the Slave Archive, Slavery Archive uh, workshop, Alex Hill, Jessica Johnson, and Vanessa Holden. Uh, the book, uh, From the Galleons to the Highlands, was born out of an article that David Eltis and David Wheat and I wrote between 2012 and 2014 which was published by the American Historical Review the following year, in 2015. This article was on the overall history of the transatlantic slave trade to the Spanish Americas, but also other internal slave trades to the Spanish colonies, and to a lesser extent, the Spanish participation of, on the slave trade. And just uh, for beginnings, even before uh, that, uh, historians of Spanish America, the Spanish colonies in the Americas from California to Buenos Aires, have not in the past, and I was among them, uh, that the figures, the numbers shown in the transatlantic slave trade database in the Slave Voyages website, do not follow that the Spanish colonies were the largest and most populated colonial empire in the Americas for 300 years. There was something uh, there. One big part uh, was the early traffic to the Spanish Caribbean, and another, the traffic coming from other colonies that was not counted, that was not acknowledged by the transatlantic slave trade database. By 2012, uh, Dave Witt was working on his book on the early Spanish Caribbean, and I was working on my own book on the Rio de la Plata, and I also started to work at that point on the slave traffic to uh, Venezuela. That's when uh, David Deltis suggests the three of us to work on that article. In the process of uh, doing the research and writing that article, we asked several historians about their own research. This led us to think that we needed to create an edited volume, something bigger that could integrate some of their work, some of the work of the people that we were asking for information. As some of this work was connected to uh, each other indeed. So for instance, I met Sabrina Smith and Pablo Sierra when they were finishing their own doctoral studies in UCLA. And since then I've been bothering them about questions on the traffic of captives to Mexico and uh, within Mexico. Uh, Jorge Felipe, who is over there in the audience, I think too, work with us, uh, adding information related the traffic of, of captives to late 18th century Cuba, both transatlantic and coming from other colonies. Uh, at that same time, about 2016, 2019, when we were already working on the edited volume, I was also working with Greg O'Malley on developing a database on slave voyages within the Americas which add, was added to the General Slave Voyages website. This is connected to this book because this type of traffic uh, within the Americas 
it's central to fully understand the entirety of the traffic of enslaved Africans within the uh, Spanish colonies. Why is this? Well, uh, because of the slave trade to the Spanish colonies was connected to other empires and colonies via inter-American routes. So you need knowledge, comprehensive knowledge to write about the slave trade to the Spanish Americas on the English slave trade, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French slave trading routes, and including the Danish and even the participation of slave traffickers from the United States, indeed, and even the, the Danish. This was one of the things for which it was very well to work with David Eldis, who has a comprehensive knowledge of each of these different uh, branches of the traffic. Also, this was a collaborative endeavor because uh, the slave trade to the Spanish colonies involved the entire 350 years of the history of the transatlantic slave trade. Few individuals, in, few historians, can write uh, about four centuries, which means that the examination of the entire traffic uh, requires collaborative research. So uh, going back to that issue of internal traffic, if you think that more than 2 million enslaved Africans arrived to the Spanish Americas, uh, we should note that ne nearly 600,000 came not directly from Africa, but from British, Portuguese, Dutch colonies, from Jamaica, from Curaçao, and from Brazil, among many, many other places. Uh, the significance of this inter-American traffic is something unique of the slave trade to the Spanish colonies. If we compare it to other imperial branches, let's say the Portuguese or the, or the British. Uh, for this book, Initially, we had authors committing chapters on most, on most of Spanish America, including Colombia, Venezuela, and Peru. Uh, but then life happens. And some of the authors drop commitments, and we were in the situation of either we had to request additional chapters or respect the pledge of other authors that were already sending the materials. And we, we choose for the, for the sake of That's how we end up with one third of the chapters on Mexico and Central America that uh, Sabrina is gonna point to that. Uh, the other thirds of the chapters on Cuba, mostly 18th century Cuba and a little bit of early 19th century Cuba and a revision of the entire traffic as well. And 18th century Portobello and Rio de la Plata and the end on abolitionism uh, of the slave trade in the Spanish America. Um, it was in this book, indeed, from the work from David Witt and Mark Eagle, that Mark Eagle is here today too, that we identified the first state voyage embarking Africans in Africa and bringing them captives uh, to the Americas. Perhaps one of the most surprising aspects of the 1619 commemorations that we saw two years ago is that few people realize that the earliest known slave voyage sailed directly from Africa to the Americas, landed some 500 years ago in Puerto Rico, a Spanish colony that eventually became an, an incorporated territory of the United States. Uh, the ship Santa Maria de la Luz embarked captive Africans, most probably in the port of Arguin, in today Mauritania, and disembarked these captives in 1520 in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Of course, this shows how the Spanish conquest of colonization of the Americas led to the creation of the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, but not also that the first slave voyage organized in the Americas, not in, in Europe, also departed from Puerto Rico in 1552. That ship outfitter was a Portuguese, uh, Domingos de Gaia, and the captain of the ship, Nuestra Señora de los Remedios, an owner of the ship was a neighbor of San Juan Puerto Rico, a vecino, a merchant also, um, Amador Gonzalez. This shows these close Spanish Portuguese connections in the making of the slave trade to the Spanish colonies from beginnings to colonization up to the 1640s. And we say that these were the first documented voyages because historians of this period think that they may be more voyages before 18. 20 disembarking captives in, Monque, in 
Santo Domingo, today the Dominican Republic, it had embarked then previously in Africa, as Santo Domingo was the center of Spanish colonialism before the conquest of uh, Mexico. Why Puerto Rico? So why there are these uh, slave wages so early on Puerto Rico? This is mostly a master of sources, as the sources on this early period on Puerto Rico are very rich. Uh, they, are, they provide a lot of detail. Uh, some even list taxes paid on goods and enslaved people disembarked by specific passengers on each ship as early as the 15 tents. There's a lot of material on Santo Domingo as well, but we don't have that level of detail as for the uh, 1520s in uh, Puerto Rico. Yet, it may appear, let's say, in notarial records of Seville that there might be some earlier transatlantic spoilway voyage and marking Africans in Africa and landing them in Santo Domingo in the 1510s, indeed. I'm not going to speak on each chapter in particular, but let me point you that they generally uncover the capillary level of the traffic of captives. This involved multiple subjects, including, for instance, the participation of free women of African ancestry in a small scale in Portobello, in Panama, as shown by the chapter of Rachel O'Toole. And this participation might be found in other crossroads of commerce, like the port of Veracruz, the port of Cartagena, and of course, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, sorry, uh, Portobello, too many ports. Uh, we always hope that this work, the, the collective volume, encourage additional research and collaboration of the entire traffic to Spanish America. We understood that this was just the beginning and requires further developments of the local historiography of each specific country, let's say Argentina, Chile, Mexico, uh, with historians here in the United States. So this requires collaboration uh, across the America. And, and on this point, let me provide you an example that doesn't come from Spanish America, but comes from our bigger neighbor, Brazil. Brazilian scholars point out as a kind of mantra that Brazil was the broad region uh, receiving the largest number of enslaved Africans on the entire history of the transatlantic slave trade. And this can, of course, from uh, the Slave Voyage website and the database as well. Uh, this had a, rest, a concrete Brazilian research origins, as it was Professor Manolo Florentino, Florentino from the Universidad Federal do Rio de Janeiro, who passed away recently, some months ago, organizing Rio de Janeiro a team of research assistants in the early 2000s, 20 years ago, indeed, uh, to do archival research on this subject and to add new information of slave voyages to Brazil to the transatlantic slave trade database. It was the work that contributed to create uh, to this mantra of the significance of Brazil for the entire history of the transatlantic slave trade. And in this way, create this collaboration, long-standing collaboration across the Americas on this kind of research. In other words, we encourage uh, the work of historians based in Latin America, and we hope to work together in the coming future, particularly, <coughs> particularly as more and more primary sources have been digitized and are online, uh, even before this recent pandemic that we are living through. Uh, just to give you another example, and, and as, a concluding, as a conclusion remark, uh, in the early 2000s, with funding from Canada and from the United States, the National Archives of Colombia digitized a series called, an archival series called Blacks and Slaves, but those who organized the National Archive back in the 19th century. So the National Archives at that moment did a 200 page catalog listing the cover page of each file and put the images online. These are boxes and boxes of archival material from the 16th century to the early 19th century. I've been working, for instance, with a grad student here in Irvine who has been combing these materials to find evidence of new or undocumented as slave, slave voyages going to Cartagena, Portobello, and to lesser extent, Venezuela for the 18th 
century. And there is much work to be done in the end. So uh, there is basic research, basic research still needed on this subject, which will allow for more elaborate examination on all subjects involved in the slave trade to the Spanish colonies. And with this, I'm gonna just say thank you, and I'm gonna pass the baton to Sabrina. Thank you, Alex. Um, I also wanted to thank Ana Lucia and uh, the other organizers uh, for giving us the opportunity to talk a little bit about this book. Um, and of course, I have to thank Alex and the other editors uh, of the volume. It has been uh, a great experience uh, contributing to the volume and, and you know, it's been a long time coming, uh, as Alex suggested. Uh, so I look very much look forward to our discussion today. Um, I was just going to talk a little bit about the chapters that focus on uh, Mexico and Central America. Um, and I think that in part the objective of these chapters or the connecting thread um, is that they attempt to integrate new spaces and new time periods into the discourse on the slave trade. Um, and, and as Alex suggested, we know so much about transatlantic slave traffic uh, to Spanish American ports, but we know comparatively very little um, in terms of what happens beyond arrival in the ports of uh, Veracruz and Cartagena, just as an example. Um, there are also numerous studies that focus on slavery um, in places like Mexico City, Puebla, Oaxaca, uh, Santiago de Guatemala, and of course Lima, uh, but few studies have considered the movement, activity, and transactions that were involved in the forced migration of captives to these and other locations in mainland Spanish America. So collectively, these four chapters contribute to a fuller understanding of slave traffic to and within New Spain, Central America, uh, and Peru. So I'll jump right into the chapters. Uh, and I'm covering chapters, uh, I believe, three through six. So uh, Pablo's chapter uh, titled The Slave Trade to Colonial Mexico follows the movement of African captives from the port of, of Veracruz to the interior parts of the colony of New Spain, um, and namely to the city of Puebla. Pablo's chapter is a great way to open up the discussion, um, and I think it quite literally helps us visualize the interregional and intercolonial extensions of the transatlantic slave trade in Mexico. Um, and I actually wanted to point to a statement that he makes early on on page 74, Pablo states that um, the experiences of enslaved Africans do not need to be quantified in order to be relevant, right? Um, in many ways, the work that we find in this volume and particularly in chapters three through six help to bring life to the overland journeys uh, that captives endured in Mexico and Central America. So uh, Pablo relies on a wide range of qualitative sources. I won't name them all, but uh, just a few transportation contracts uh, travel accounts and inquisition records. Um, and he describes the three main trade routes that connected Veracruz uh, and the highlands. And he argues that the traffic of African captives was almost entirely dependent upon mule trains. Um, so again, he describes the Southern, the Northern and the hybrid routes. But I found that the southernmost route was particularly interesting um, because his description of this route quite literally pushes us to consider the construction, purpose, and utility of these roads. Obviously, commercial routes were built to expedite the movement of valuable goods and, and people, right? But the discussion of the dangers of these roads and the threat of attack by Maroons pushes us to think about the ways in which Africans and African descended populations used and potentially even took over Cartesian space. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about for quite some time um, as I work on Oaxaca um, and I'm looking onward to, to Central America. So um, by following these roads, Pablo exposes not only the geographic terrain that enslaved people traversed, um, which of course included roads, mountain ranges and rivers, um, but he also offers insight on the regional economies that would sustain this overland traffic of human beings. Um, and his, in his discussion of these overland journeys, Pablo highlights the importance of mule trains, right? Which were needed to move dozens of captives at a time, 
but equally important were the participants in this traffic, which included muleteers, cooks, barber surgeons, and innkeepers. And some of these people were enslaved as well. So essentially, Pablo walks us through each step of that journey uh, in New Spain. Following a chronological arc, the next chapter, uh, Paul Loken's chapter, exposes the dynamic population of West Central Africans in Guatemala in the first half of the 17th century. Paul tracks uh, 1,709 captives through notarial records. You'll see that's a connecting thread through most of these chapters. Um, the uh, notarial records that are housed in the Archivo General de Centro América. Building on Pablo's chapter, Paul uh, reveals the high number of captives who arrived in Guatemala from West Central Africa. And like the other chapters in this volume, Paul's chapter also reminds us that the traffic of African captives in Spanish America was much greater, and in some cases possibly double what has been found for the early 17th century. Why does this matter? Well, as David Altis, Alice Boruki, and David Wheat argued in their article, Atlantic Slavery and the Slave Trade, scholars have severely underestimated the African arrivals who came during the early colonial period. Um, and as Pablo Sierra and Tatiana Cejas noted in their article, uh, The Persistence of the Slave Market in 17th Century Central Mexico, the slave trade to New Spain did not collapse after 1640. And in fact, my chapter in this volume shows that it continued into the early 18th century, pardon. So by bringing Central America into this discussion, Paul shows that Santiago de Guatemala was both what he considers as a crossroads and a final destination for West Central Africans who were forcefully transported to Central America in the early 17th century. I would add um, that it continued to be a, a crossroads for free and enslaved people into the late 17th century too. So it seems that West Central Africans arrived via the Honduran port of uh, Trujillo um, and they were transported overland to uh, Santiago. But Paul also points to another slaving route that connects Cartagena, Nicaragua, and Santiago. And so from this sample of over 1,700 people, Paul finds that the vast majority were identified as Angolas. Um, and this follows the trend that we see with African arrivals at other Spanish American ports in the early period. But what's fascinating is that between the 1630s and 1650s, Santiago then becomes a supplier of enslaved people for other locations. Um, and specifically, West Central Africans were transported south to Peru, Nicaragua, and Panama, um, but captives were also sold to buyers uh, in New Spain. Some of my records show that, as well as uh, that of Pablo's chapter. Um, and the case study of El Salvador exposes the dynamism of the forced migration of Africans in the Pacific Americas. Chapter five uh, is on interregional slave trading in and around Antequera, uh, New Spain, between 1680 and 1710. And really, this chapter shows the complex and irregular nature and wide range of experiences within the transatlantic, transpacific, inter American, and interregional slave trades. Aside from focusing on a later time period, this chapter shows that most of the enslaved people in Antequera, uh, which is broadly in the Valley of Oaxaca, um, and its surrounding regions were in fact American-born bondsmen and bondswomen. So I argue that the interregional and intercolonial trades of American-born uh, enslaved people continued alongside the transatlantic slave trade, but of course in larger numbers and with greater variation. So for the most part, this chapter is then focusing more on the forced migration of enslaved people within the colony of New Spain, as opposed to uh, focusing on uh, transport from the coast to interior regions. This is important because, again, to fully understand the transatlantic and intra-American uh, intra trades, we must consider these inter-regional extensions that persisted long after 1640. So what did that interregional traffic look like? Um, in some cases, there was the forced movement of dozens of captives via mule trains, as Pablo discusses in chapter three. Uh, I focus on a case study of 53 Af African captives who entered the colony through Veracruz and were transported directly to Antequera. 
Um, well, it seems that in 1682, the demand in Antequera must have not been so great because uh, several of those individuals were then sold to buyers in other locations, including Puebla and Nejapa, right? So we see that it ends up uh, becoming quite messy um, and, and certainly complex. Um, in other instances, these were transactions conducted between two independent parties. So it wasn't so much of a streamlined traffic or armazón de esclavos um, as we find with, with the former example. Um, and not surprisingly, many of those buyers were elites, members of the church, um, colonial officials, uh, and wealthy women. I do want to note uh, the types of labels that appear in the notarial records, right? And notaries often use the labels de Nación Congo, Angola, Luanda, or Mozambique in reference to the origins of captives or broadly the, the regions of embarkation in Africa. Um, I also found smaller numbers of people who were uh, specifically identified as Mandinga, Bran, and Casta Rosada. So my findings show that more than half of the individuals sold in Antequera were born in the Americas, which then emphasizes the interregional trades over the transatlantic traffic. These Creoles generally hailed from all over the place, literally, um, but mostly Veracruz, Mexico City, Puebla, and Santiago. Fewer people arrived from Chiapas, Puerto Rico, Cuba, and Lima. In other words, African and American born captives hailed from near and far, which then offers insight on the diverse enslaved population in Antequera in the late 17th century. Adding to this complexity are the smaller numbers of African captives who arrived in the colony via the Trans-Pacific trade. Um, and I describe a, a case study of a bondsman named Antonio who was purchased in Antequera in uh, 1703. And the bill of sale details that uh, Antonio was captured in Mozambique, which again is likely somewhere in East Africa. Um, he was transported through the Indian Ocean trade to Manila, enslaved to a religious cleric there in Manila for a period of time, then sold to a lowly trader also in Manila, pardon, who later transported Antonio to Acapulco in New Spain. So, and I consider this man a lowly trader because uh, while he was in Acapulco, he didn't have enough money to cover his sustenance and housing for the two weeks that he was there. Um, and so he ended up trading Antonio to clear that debt, which totaled something like 350 pesos. So the series of transactions then reveals several aspects of slave traffic in New Spain. Right. On the one hand, this is just one example of the complexity and irregularity of the slave trade in the interior. But on the other hand, this case study also helps us connect global commerce and trafficking to local economies in mainland Spanish America. Um, and Rachel O'Toole drives home that latter point more clearly in her chapter, Securing Subjecthood. Uh, Rachel provides uh, the kind of thick description of the terrain that we also find in Pablo's contribution, but of course, with an emphasis on Panama in the mid to late 17th century. And so this chapter examines the commercial connections between Panama, the Andes, uh, and the broader Atlantic and Pacific markets. Uh, and through a careful analysis of notarial records in northern Peru, she reveals that the actions and labor of free and enslaved people were the basis of local and regional economies. And as she indicates on page 150, their work, quote, fueled the trans-imperial intra-American slave trades of the colonial Americas. So this chapter more explicitly connects the actions of individual men and women of color um, within local economies to the global commerce of the Atlantic and Pacific worlds. Rachel offers incredible insight on what was happening on the ground in the Panamanian Isthmus during the 17th century. For instance, enslaved people worked in agriculture and in turn that food was used to feed the recent African arrivals. Um, likewise, free women worked as cooks and nurses in the warehouses of slave trading agents. Uh, free black militiamen protected the slave trade and the commerce of valuable goods. At the same time, Free and enslaved people understood that they were critical actors to these 
local and global economies. And so they exercise various forms of agency to improve their circumstances. Uh, she gives a number of examples of both free and enslaved people and, and shows that um, the enslaved often blurred the boundaries between captivity and freedom. Um, and in fact, in reference to a free person, I was surprised to learn about um, African descended men who were notaries uh, in Panama. Um, that kind of um, occupation was simply unheard of for an African descended person in Oaxaca and, and most likely in the rest of New Spain. So through numerous examples, we find that free men and women of color amassed a considerable amount of wealth in Panama, and some free people were even involved in the slave trade as well. So I'll quickly wrap up. Um, these four chapters primarily rely on notarial data to reconstruct this diverse and complex slave trading network that extended from New Spain all the way down to Peru, and it spanned from the late 16th century to the 18th century. Um, so I'll hand it over back to uh, Alex. Thank you so much. And to Anna. Okay, then um, thank you so much for this presentation because it was uh, very clear and a great overview of the book and also a number of questions that of course all of us uh, we are thinking about. Then uh, just to ask you if you have any questions, you can just click on reactions uh, and uh, raise your hands. Um, also, if you are on YouTube, let me just check. Uh, you can always ask your questions on YouTube. Who is going to be the first? Um, then I, I think that one of the, the questions, I will start uh, with uh, one of the questions that I think that is, um, it would be great if you are able to revisit this question, uh, this sort of erasure that we see regarding the, the Spanish uh, uh, slave trade and the slave trade then to what uh, became uh, Spanish America's which essentially is uh, everything in the Americas that is not Canada, United States, and, um, and Brazil. Uh, at the same time, uh, what the presentations and the different chapters in the book they show, of course, is that uh, these uh, loser Brazilian uh, uh, um, agents, they were also not uh, totally separated from um, the routes uh, associated with the, the Spanish slave trade. But I would like to you to tell us more. Uh, there are two dimensions here. First, the this sort of uh, absence, uh, the lack of studies focusing on this, uh, this region. We want to know uh, because one of the elements that you brought in the, the presentation and that we see from the chapters in the book as well is the, the amount of available sources, uh, either in archives in the Americas, but also uh, in Spain and, um, uh, and even in Portugal. And this, uh, at the same time uh, that we have this erasure in terms of the, the history, um, you also brought another element that, um, uh, the, the, the dish of Brazil, then Brazil becoming that we emphasized uh, often. To us, it looks like it's that this is emphasized uh, for far too often that Brazil is uh, the region, but indeed it's, it's not because of the region, it's the, the country itself, whereas the, the Spanish Americas was uh, after the independence um, divided into multiple nations. And this is why uh, we are comparing a country that became Brazil with a large region that today has several countries. Um, but uh, of course, that is still in the context of the United States, uh, people do not even know that Brazil is important. Then to then uh, the distortion goes even further because they think that the, it's the United States that is the, the focus. And I think that this kind of book that you produced here is particularly important, especially because of the debates that we had uh, over the last two years, that is this big emphasis on 1619. Uh, and this very country uh, encompassed then regions that are regions um, where it was in the past during the period of the Atlantic slave trade, uh, the, the Spanish Americas, regions that were colonized by the Spanish. And I would like you to 
to to to to develop a little bit more why there is this sort of absence because even in the united states today the 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 minorities then the number of people who have spanish uh, or latin american heritage is, is huge uh, and the second element as well is is to think in terms of the the memory of this uh, this trade uh, and this uh, african presence there has been efforts then we know a little bit about uh, vera cruz we know a little bit about uh, of course, in the, the Caribbean, where we have these monuments, you have museums, you have a number of initiatives. But there are regions that for very, very long, we, uh, we do not even think that there are these pop Black populations today and where we don't find uh, visible traces of um, this uh, uh, slave trading past. I am thinking here, especially, of course, about uh, we know, but most people do not. Then uh, when you are referring to Argentina, when you are referring even to Uruguay and it places as, uh, as uh, perhaps that people do not imagine that also had uh, populations of African descent, uh, Chile, uh, Bolivia, Paraguay, and so on. Then if you would like to talk a little bit about the, the erasure of this history and also the invisibility of this memory. Well, I, I may go into parts of that, uh, and, and that this especially with the emphasis on, on the historiography, on, on the slave traffic uh, to Spanish America that traditionally has been on a 19th century Cuba and 19th century Spain, and, and the connection of people moving between Spain and Cuba and the larger uh, transatlantic slave traffic to Cuba in the 19th century, which is uh, almost half of the entirety of, of the traffic to the Spanish Empire, which is um, indeed big. Um, you can see some of, of these questions of uh, memory and, and dealing especially with monuments in, in, in the case, for instance, of Catalonia, in, Barcelona with uh, discussions about the removal of statues of Spanish slave traders of the uh, mid to late uh, 19th century, who then became prominent capitalists of uh, Catalonia, of uh, Barcelona, indeed. Usually the earlier period uh, doesn't get that acknowledged, for instance, for this, in the case of Spain, for the period of the 16th century or the 17th century, all combined. Uh, traditionally, uh, scholars have pointed that there were mostly Portuguese who did that kind of traffic. There were not the Spaniards. But actually, there is a good record of local historians, let's say, writing from the Canary Island or writing from Cadiz or writing from Seville, or some local historians in. Uh, working on uh, Veracruz or uh, Puerto Rico, pointing at actually initiatives of local Spanish merchants, both located in the Iberian Peninsula and uh, the Americas at, uh, at, at that. And, and that doesn't have traveled well into the larger historiography. Um, I, I know for sure that the work of Dave Wick and Mark Eagle, who is around, they are very criterious of sitting, of citing all the Spanish and Portuguese uh, historians who have wrote on this really, really, really early um, traffic uh, to the Americas, which are mostly uh, very local, especially the ones, for instance, on the on the Canary Island, indeed. Thank you, Alex. I think that we have Robert uh, who is uh, raising his hand. Uh, I think I unmute myself. No, you're fine. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, good after, uh, Good evening. Uh, thank you very much for uh, such a wonderful talk. Um, I have a question about, about economic, it's kind of an economic history question. Uh, the, the, 
it was first of all, I love the way you 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 connect the the quantitative with the qualitative with the subjective, right? That's one of the things that I really see coming out of the talk. One of the I, one of the, I think wonderful things, very interesting things that is so relevant to the history of capitalism and slavery, which I know Jennifer Morgan will be talking about her uh, books, uh, her upcoming book. And there's so much about this. The connection, the, the, the thing that is, intrigues me about this talk is how you see these societies that are typically portrayed as um, society with slaves as opposed to slave societies. Right, it's not plant big plantation production mm -hmm. as you see in Cuba, Puerto Rico, all over Brazil. Right, it is small scale, and yet what you see is that they are absolutely integral to the development of an international, you know, of an international economic system. Call it capitalism, call it nascent, whatever you want to call the, what is happening there. You are seeing local production, local networks that are small scale, but yet have it collectively have a large importance in the internet development and the international economic uh, thing. So I'm just wondering um, if, if that is too strong a statement or if that's the kind of thing that you're, that you are trying to develop or is it something else? I'm just curious what your response would be. Thank you. I can tackle this question. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, and, and I wanna use this question to also kind of circle back to, uh, to the previous question about um, the lack of studies and why now and why are we talking about this, right? <clears throat> um, and Robert, I think you did a great synopsis of exactly what we're trying to do, right? We're not talking about thousands and th or tens of thousands of populations of enslaved people. Well, in the case of Puebla, um, I mean, Pablo does have upwards of like 20,000 bills of sale or, or transactions that have been processed in, in Puebla in the early period. But many of these other locations, and I can personally speak to, to the case of Oaxaca, we're dealing with, I have a couple of thousand um, bills of sale, right? So the numbers are significantly smaller um, in terms of the production of valuable commodities, sugar production, right, just as, to give one example here, um, is small scale, in some cases geared toward um, local consumption, broadly within the colony. But in many cases, when we talk about the high value items, whether that's silver um, or more importantly for the case of Oaxaca, uh, cochineal, um, there is the involvement of free and enslaved populations um, who are contributing to these high value commodities that are certainly um, becoming part of the global uh, marketplace, right? And, and yes, this is emerging capitalism, absolutely. So I would say that, that you're spot on with describing it in that particular way, right? Is that we cannot solely think of capitalism um, and its association with slavery with regards to the sugar plantations of Cuba or that of Brazil, right? Or gold mining in, in the interior in Brazil, rather these smaller scale productions, forms of production can also connect to that too. Um, and to Ana Lucia's question, which I was jotting down some notes about that, about the lack of studies and, and, and erasure in history. I just wanted to add to, to something that Alex had mentioned that is, um, okay, on the one hand, we have why now, right? There's this gap uh, in the case of New Spain uh, and the studies on New Spain between um, the work of Colin Palmer from the 90s, right? And then Pablo uh, Sierra's dis a, a book that came out in 2018, right? So, so a significant period of time that had passed before we revisited this question of uh, slave traffic in New Spain. And the assumption was that, oh, after 1640, uh, slave traffic pretty much dies down almost entirely. Um, and his book shows us that that's not in fact the case and, and emerging studies including some of my work show that it actually continued to a trickle, but still continued for a period of time into the 18th century. I would say that much of that has to do with the emergence of, of um, grassroots efforts in, within Mexico, within the Mexican Academy, right? Um, and much of that influencing and shaping what we see happen in the US Academy. But at the same time, there is this significant period of time that passes that we don't see you know, much in terms of coming back to that conversation. Um, and so the latter question is to, I mean, these other locations where we don't visibly see black populations. I work on a, on a location that's like that, right? Um, in the colonial era, uh, Oaxaca City had a significant Black population, and yet if you walk around town today, you don't see much of that. And yet in the Costa Chica, um, 
the Pacific coast of, of uh, Oaxaca and, and the states of Guerrero, uh, there are sizable concentrations of, of black populations, right? So there is something to be said about the fact that there are these sort of pockets, but as we're now seeing with the 2020 census um, for Mexico, that in fact, the black population was much more widespread. Um, it's a matter of sort of like gathering this information. Um, aside from that, in terms of the rich notarial source base, uh, which you see in much of the chapters uh, or many of the chapters, um, I would say that a lot of that has to do with these local histories, right? These regional histories, these micro histories, whether that's case studies on Puebla, Cholula, Mexico City, Oaxaca, um, uh, Zacatecas, right? Uh, pockets of studies just for the talking about New Spain. Um, but it's an incredible amount of work to try to build this traffic, right? And understand what this looks like. Um, and that was actually something I wanted to talk about um, during the talk. So I'm so, I'm asked, uh, I'm so glad that Ana Lucia asked that question that this um, act of or practice of uh, tracking people via bills of sale and working backwards from the most recent uh, uh, contract or bill of sale is, is a tedious and, and um, uh, a time consuming process, right? And, and I think it gets even more tricky and muddy the further back we go um, in terms of looking into a person's origins, right? Um, <clears throat> for the location that I study um, in Oaxaca, the descriptions of locations are, are broad, right? Uh, Congo, Angola, Luanda, Mozambique. Mozambique, that doesn't necessarily mean that that individual came from Mozambique, ra rather somewhere broadly in, in East Africa. Um, and so it becomes even more difficult to trace that individual, especially at the late, you know, in the late 17th century or early um, 18th century. Thank um, you so much, Sabrina. Go ahead. You want to go, Alex? Yeah, no, on, on, on the question of, of Bob, um, if I might call you Bob. Um, there are pockets of, of history within the long history of the Spanish America that the slave traffic actually was central to certain places. Buenos Aires from 1580, from the foundation up to 1640, would not have survived without the slave trade, meaning that 70% of all commerce in Buenos Aires was the slave trade in that foundational period, in which you have uh, Rio de Janeiro founded in 1565, uh, Luanda in, seven, in 1575, and Buenos Aires in 1580. So you have all these three ports founded within 50 years, and they created a South Atlantic uh, axis that made the survival of Buenos Aires as a city, since the first foundation of Buenos Aires uh, was kaput in 1536. And, and then in, in my own part of, of a study for the late colonial period from the late 18th century, early 19th century, for some years, for the entire Rio de la Plata, perhaps the slave trade was one third of the value of all commerce, which is huge for Buenos Aires and uh, Montevideo. We need to have certain comparisons as well in other places of connections like Cartagena, or uh, Veracruz, or of course, uh, Havana in, in that sense as well. Um, yes, that was it. Thank you, Alex. Uh, who else would have uh, questions? People are shy today. Let's see if I see any hands. Uh, oh, yes, we have Alexandra and then Jorge uh, or Jorge Felipe. I don't, I, I'm not sure if it's Spanish or, it's or very Portuguese. Spanish. <laughs> okay, let's go then. Alexandra, let me just replace the spotlight. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, well, thank you for this, this really important book. Um, it's help, definitely helped my work tremendously. Um, my question is about, well, I have two questions actually. The first is about, um, this idea of the clandestine trade. And um, I work in Santiago de Cuba. And so, you know, it's very clear that the data we have on the trade in enslaved Africans and then the data on the social life of African descendants don't match up. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about some of the indicators um, about the, the clandestine trade. 
And then my second question is about um, the circulatoriness of the diaspora and particularly from the continent to Iberia, to the Americas. Um, one of the kind of conflicts that I've, I've encountered inside of the local literature in Santiago is this category of Ladinos, right? And the negation of Africanity amongst Ladinos and this assumption that um, they had assimilated to Iberian life ways. But when we start looking at some of the, the routes that were occurring, we know that you know, this happened, a person could have been enslaved from the, on the continent, brought to Iberia, and then brought to the Americas within their lifetime. So I was wondering if you could talk about those two dynamics a little bit more. Thank you, Alexandra. I don't know who is, wants to respond. If Alex, oh, okay. Uh, well, it, one of the things on, on, on doing research on Spanish American archives is that everything is duplicated or triplicated. So you may find um, parts of one story in Santiago de Cuba, in Havana, in Seville, in Simancas, in Madrid, who knows where, at least that, that happens uh, to us. Um, and the fact that some slave trade, particularly in the 17th and 18th century, went through the process of um, post de facto legalization of slave arrivals, make the case for that there are some kind of uh, record of each, uh, of, of, of this uh, traffic, uh, indeed. The, the issue that you mentioned about these uh, diasporic identities, um, it's intriguing and also points to how people move from one place to another. I, I'm, I thought about uh, African leaders, let's say in Montevideo or Buenos Aires, but also in Cuba, who travel to Madrid in order to plead cases if they were the leaders of a Catholic black confraternity of they were the captains or uh, free black militias and they came back. So. Uh, you, you have these kind of records of people uh, of African ancestry, some of them African born who free, free themselves, uh, being either a captain of a free black militia or the leader of a free black confraternity, of a, sorry, of a black confraternity. And sometimes they were both at the same time. And, and they end up traveling uh, to Spain in order to litigate in Spain or in order, or they send their own representatives of the group uh, to Spain. One thing doesn't eliminate the other as well as, as uh, leaders of uh, black social organizations have very complex social identities and they play these complex social identities also depending of what was the audience, particularly in the system of litigation uh, under Spanish colonialism. And that's it. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we have uh, uh, Jorge Felipe and then Alex. Please go ahead, Jorge. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi, Alex. How is it going? Representation. This is one of the authors, by the way. Huh? This is one of the authors, by the way. Yes, I'm one of the uh, collaborators in the in the book. So, Alex, uh, I have a uh, oh for any of you, of course. Uh, but I have this question based on the article, which is also the introduction of the book that you wrote with uh, David Altis and David Weed. And one of the great discoveries that you guys made is that more slaves arrived to the Spanish Americas than to the British Americas. Am I, am I correct on that? That's one of the... Yeah. And, and, and also that's one thing that is growing as we continue. Exactly, and it's growing, so it, it is pretty, pretty much clear right now that, that after Brazil, the Spanish America is the other big uh, regional center of importation of Africans. So, but my question is how these uh, numbers challenge the Anglo-Saxon idea or the Anglo-Saxon school to put, it, to put it properly of the connection between uh, slavery and the slave trade and capitalism and industrialization because one of the main ideas of uh, that you can trace back to Eric Williams, but was contested by Dreshner, but now we can see it in the new US version, then there is a direct correlation between slavery 
and uh, industrialization and capitalism. You can see that in the new economic history of Harvard as well. But yet the numbers, as in the case in the Spanish America demonstrate, and the, the same case can be made for Brazil, prove that these places who also had even more slave and also were slave societies, in the case of Cuba, for example, did not develop the industrial revolution, they, they did not develop industrial system, and of course they, they didn't experience the economic growth that England and uh, the United States experienced. So my question is, based on all this that I said, uh, do you think that these numbers from this uh, Iberian perspective challenge this notion of there is a correlation between slavery and capitalism or putting other, another way that the reason for or the cause for the industrial revolution is a slavery when it could be something else. So that's my question. Thank you. I don't know if um, Sabrina or Alex want to jump in. Um, I can just jump in a little bit, but clearly, Alex, the question is directed to you. I would just say um, that to me, this is very clearly early forms of capitalism, right? And I'm so glad you brought up the the, the topic of uh, in the book, you know, Eric Williams' work, um, because we are so um, our training is so ingrained in the notion that. Uh, capitalism or slavery is directly tied to capitalism, right? And that's where we see the earliest forms of it. But again, that's tied to the industrial revolution to a much later period than, than what we're talking about here and then what many of us study here. Um, I mean, at least in, in the classes that I teach on the diaspora, I say that these are most certainly forms of early forms of global capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but Alex, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on this. Well, uh, actually, uh, it has been used, uh, this argument that actually both Brazil and the Spanish Americas receive uh, the largest number of enslaved Africans throughout the history of uh, colonization and even post-colonization, if you think Brazil as an uh, independent country, uh, to counter uh, this argument. Some others have mentioned, for instance, how the, and I'm thinking about uh, David Richardson. He's a British uh, scholar, now, now retired in, in Hull. How actually the uh, British actually benefited from the, this internal slave trade happening in the 18th century to uh, the Spanish America and how that worked within uh, 18th century uh, merchant capitalism in, in England, basically as the traffic of captives to parts of Spanish America, particularly in the Caribbean, was basically one additional branch of the British transatlantic uh, slave trade. Um, another point to do uh, about this issue is the connection of uh, the slave trade to Spanish America and the traffic of silver, which was the commodity that made possible globalization in the 16th century to the 19th century, in which the Spanish silver peso, el peso de ocho reales, talking in them, um, was uh, the global commodity accepted in Europe and for global trade with China, in which China traded with Europe and with, let's say, European traders that are born in Europe or in the Americas, mostly to get this silver into, into China. And a big part of this silver to the Netherlands and England came, of course, with the trade to the Spanish Americas, which was the source of silver. And particularly, we have to see when time and, and, and where um, through the slave trade. That was, for instance, what uh, the, the slave traders of the United States that work Jorge for your period in the late 18th century, early 19th century. At the beginning in Cuba, they are getting silver before uh, sugar. And that silver didn't stay there in the United States, but actually was to favor uh, the global commerce of the United States in the early 19th century with 
uh, China. Uh, just to put some others, this is to put some others arguments regarding this issue on slavery and capitalism. Uh, the English seems sometimes to label that the only thing that is capitalism took place in England. <laughs> or uh, the only thing that is capitalism took place in the 19th century and then connect uh, the, the industrial uh, revolution or second capitalism with what is called uh, second slavery in 19th century United States, uh, Cuba and Brazil. But uh, there are different angles for uh, this debate, both on the 18th century and the 19th century. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Then we have uh, our Alex who has a question. Then let me just have him. All the Alexes. I like it. <laughs> so this this question is kind of meta, but it's a question that's been every time we read a book in the in the Slavery Archive book club uh, related to the Spanish Americas, so to the Spanish Empire. It's just I can't help but but we leave this question because I grew up in Dominican Republic. I was born and raised there. I'm, I'm, I consider myself Dominican, not Dominican American. I, I, this is part of my world. My world comes from the world described in this book. And, and yet this, no, this idea that it's the world that is the most behind in the research. It's the world that, um, that somehow fails to engage not only at the local level, although there is work, as you, as you mentioned uh, in, the, in the book, happening at the local regional level, but fails to connect transnationally. At, at the same time, that is also a region that has this transnational identity as Latinos, Latin Americans. It has this kind of like bond that nobody asked them to have because there is no political union as in Europe. Um, so I wanted to ask the team, those members of the team, um, uh, and why do you think, if you can elaborate a little bit more of why, of the why and the how, like I, like for example, I can theorize based on what I know about the conditions of research in higher ed in the Dominican Republic, that we just don't have money right now. And that the people who do dominate uh, the, the training of history in the Dominican Republic are, are light skinned, uh, they're, they belong to a nationalist tradition that is not going to contribute uh, resources and create incentives for this type of research. That, so my hypothesis would be that we find uh, similar dynamics like this uh, in other countries in, in Latin America, but you would know more than I do. So my question is, like, is, is that a valid hypothesis? What's going on? Why, why is Latin America behind the Francophone world, the Anglophone world? And then the how, how do we create the conditions to create the incentives to do the research that follows this? Because if this is the next right step, then how do we create material conditions for the for 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 that massive amount of research that needs to happen, uh, that needs to come? That's my. It's a big question. I know. I'm sorry. It, it's actually kind of two big questions. Okay. Okay. Who wants to jump? Then it can be Alex or Sabrina or any other of the contributors who are still with us at this point. It. it, it, it there's Mark Eagle, who is a historian of the uh, Dominican Republic, uh, a run of the early Santo Domingo, if you want to go into. But on, on my own self, I was commenting last week a panel of LASA of the Latin American Studies Association. And um, La Sociedad Genealógica de Puerto Rico, the Genealogic Society of Puerto Rico, the Society of the Genealogists, um, as a result of the debates regarding the 2010 U.S. Census, because you know, the Puerto Rico is part of the U.S., uh, they compile a catalog on the history of Africans in Puerto Rico that was published around 2013 or 14 or 15, I, I don't exactly remember uh, the date, that points at all genealogical research on these materials based on Puerto Rico, literally from the super early 1500s, 16th century, then there is a big gap on, on these records that they manage. And then Africans start to appear again in the 19th, again, in the 19th century, when you see a, a more direct 
traffic to uh, Spanish America. This was obviously part of the debates about uh, black history within Puerto Rico uh, as a result of the census, the US census in 2010 of how to count people and also the different racial understandings in the United States and Puerto Rico, which are uh, huge as well. This led to one of the most, in Latin America, you know, the, some of the most conservative historians or scholars are in this kind of societies, you know, the, the Sociedad Genealógica de Santa Maria, the Sociedad Genealógica de Lima, in this kind of uh, uh, genealogical societies. But this, this, this push the genealogical society there to do this kind of basic research that now is used by other scholars to do network research, uh, to putting people together uh, on Africans in Puerto Rico. Uh, Mark, I, know, I don't know if you want to talk about a little bit on the specifics of the uh, uh, Dominican Republic. Yeah, I can chime in a little bit. I, I feel like I'm deeply unqualified to kind of address a larger question about uh, Latin America in general, but for, for the Dominican Republic, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is something that's been dominated by mostly white skin scholars. I mean, I'm probably because I'm unqualified, I'm a white dude from California. Uh, but I think that in the past, it has been scholars with the money who, to go live in Spain for years and use those records. The Dominican Republic specifically doesn't have a lot of the early records. And so students, as far as I understand, rely on transcriptions by Demo uh, Rodriguez de Morizzi is the one who transcribed a bunch of materials. So they've had to rely on that. My hope is that digitization will make a big difference. Uh, a lot of the kind of memorable scholarship is often in English, and that has always seemed really weird to me. There's some great stuff, you know, by Cuban historians, by Dominican historians, by Puerto Rican historians, but a lot of the kind of the books that get a lot of attention end up being in English. Uh, and, and my hope is that sort of this digitization will sort of lead to this democratization where people can sort of know their own history. I mean, there's others, as you know, other factors in the Dominican Republic, the kind of tension with Haiti, I think, has steered people away from studying the African slave trade for a whole lot of reasons for a long time. Uh, but I, I recognize what you're saying, and I'm not sure I have a lot of great explanations for it. No, and we have also the phenomenon where a lot of the diaspora scholars, uh, the, the diaspora scholars are a completely different community. And, and for example, Antonio Acevedo and the CUNY Dominican Institute here in New York have done a great work. They have the a wonderful website with a lot of resources that already digitized uh, the first blacks in America, et cetera. So, that, so, 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 the, so work is done, but we can never say, I, I think this is mentioned in the book in several points, including in the introduction, that we can never say it amounts to the sort of efforts that are being done in the Francophone and English uh, speaking worlds. And I think it's also because those two speaking worlds also, the publishing industry for scholarly work in those worlds is heavily financed in a way that is not in the Latin, like Spanish production. Uh, uh, a Spanish-speaking production is, is, is great in heavily subsidized economies like Mexico, uh, Argentina, etc. For, for open access scientific production, but like the rest of Latin America, like, like maybe Colombia, but, but like Dominican Republic, like we, 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 we don't have money, uh, at least the people who live there. So the people who do have money are the people who already have money. Right, so that the Moritzis of the world and, the, and his inheritors are like people who are already upper middle class and this kind of stuff, and they're the ones who form the la sociedad, the genealogía, y todas las cosas. So, um, so this is what I'm, I, I was just trying to look to see if there was a little hope, at least in your team, since you've seen the the, the, the beast in the eye, uh, uh, for 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 Spanish speaking production, scholarly production that can actually rise to the level of the of the francophone and the and the and not the lusophone, right? Right, because we've seen it in the book club and. and and I and and I and I've seen it with 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 the team, uh, but but I guess you guys don't want to offer that false hope. Um, no, no, I feel like I, I can actually say like there's a little bit of hope. I feel like I mean I haven't been the AGI now for what three years, but in in Seville there was a kind of new wave of interest in 17th century Caribbean, specifically Dominican Republic, and so I think there's something coming. I'm not, I don't want to be overly rosy about it, but I think the tide is shifting. The Caribbean is now interesting in a way it wasn't 10 years ago. So I'm I'm hoping that that leads to some new scholarship and some new directions. It's a little bit of hope. <laughs> I hope. <so>. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like to jump in just to, to add something. I know that Jorge has uh, wants to, to speak, but um, I think that it's not only in the particular case of the Dominican Republic, I don't think that is only the issue of lack of uh, resources. Uh, we should not uh, ignore also how these ideologies of uh, racial democracy in the case of the Latin America, Mr. Sahi, played an important role uh, for the societies to believe that they are 
they do not have black people. And then of course, in most of these places, we have to agree that either in Brazil or in Argentina or in all the places that um, uh, where uh, these issues are um, uh, in play, there are still white scholars who dominate the, the academia. Uh, in, in, is, this, is this still the case everywhere? When you see black scholars working about these issues, they are US scholars usually. Then it's not only a problem of a Dominican Republic that has, uh, even Brazil that is considered the blackest country, it's, it's white people who have positions in the universities and who are studying history of Africa and history of the Atlantic slave trade. This is changing, but it's still that it is changing in the sense that we have more black scholars having access to the university and becoming PhDs and getting positions, but it's still, they are not talking about the slave trade. They are usually talking about race and racism. And during the pandemic, we can see if you look at this um, YouTube lives and all these events that Brazilian scholars who are black, uh, what they are doing in these events, they are talking about, uh, about race. Then uh, is it still uh, in all places, I, I think that is still dominated, but the Dominican Republic is particularly a, a, a problematic um, a problematic country in terms of accepting this, uh, the, the presence of people of African descent uh, there, then I still believe that what um, uh, I think that Mark mentioned, uh, digital, uh, the digitization of these, uh, these archives, I think that this is an element that can help. And also, uh, of course, that in terms of what book, which books are published, uh, perhaps the, the production is, um, than not as big as in, in other regions. But is for example, when you are in the US, when you are not living in the country, ask to Alex, we and to all of us, we are always sharing these on social media, these books that are published in the original languages. To get a book today, for example, that is published in Brazil is, is hard. If I have to buy the book, uh, it's not something that is uh, that is easy to be done. Then I have to buy through the United States, to, through a place that sells these books, buy a book that is published in Uruguay, but these days also taking very long and very hard to, to have access to. Then this is why I think that uh, with this initiative that you are doing here, and even with the, the lessons that you learned from the pandemic, is that the, the things that are digitized and are made accessible are important. In this kind of space that you have this opportunity of having people from other places that who would never be here uh, talking with us because you would need money to get all people from other uh, countries. Um, this is something that uh, we should uh, continue to, to promote. But now that I uh, have my, um, uh, that I ramble a little bit, let's just have Jorge in after Elliot. Thank you. I, I think, Alex, I was thinking, uh, Alex Gill, about your question. And um, I think connects pretty well with what uh, Ana Lucia Araujo was um, asking, the first question she asked, our erasure of history about why this is something that is not discussed in the Spanish Americas. And I think one uh, first probably cause of this is that the lack of abolitionist movement in Latin America at large. I know there are historians who have been finding, who have found uh, cases of abolitionism in Spain and in some places in Latin America, but those seem to me more the exception of the rule. So like the British empire, or the United States, there was not an abolitionist movement from the top. Of course, there was from below, from the slave rebellions and all that, but from the top, there wasn't. So that means that for a long time, those who have the power to publish, those who have the power to rescue the voice of the slaves, like it happens in, in the United States and the British Empire in England, that, that, that condition didn't exist in, in, in Latin America. That's why, unlike the United States, we don't have uh, many uh, slave testimonies. We have uh, the one from Cuba and we have a couple of them, but that's it. And we don't have many and, and that's partially because of the lack of abolitionism that at the same time connects with something deeper in the Spanish empire, which is the lack of uh, a belief in individual rights, uh, which is something that developed and it was completely strange and foreign to 
the Spanish Empire. And I think that then in the 20th century, after there was no abolitionism in the 19th century, I think that also that connect with uh, what Ana Lucia Araujo was mentioning, this idea of racial democracy. You have Fernando Ortiz, you have Freire, and all of them painted this picture of uh, pretty much that uh, there was a sort of melting pot. And so how talking about race was divisive. And I think that's more or less the, the state of things now, including in places like Cuba that had the biggest uh, slave trade in the, in, the whole, in the whole of the Spanish empire. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, that that's uh, basically that, that's something that usually we don't take too much into consideration, but the, the lack of uh, abolitionist movement in Latin America, where these people are even censoring, and by these people, I mean the elite in Latin America is even censoring the Pope. In, in 1835, when the Pope uh, spoke against the slavery, they decided that's not going to be published in Cuba, the, the Pope itself. So of course, you can imagine that nothing can filter through that like thick censorship that the Spanish empire had, including anything that had to do with the slave trade. That's something that you don't talk about. And uh, that, that's the story of the 19th century Cuba, at least. I'm inclined to believe that that's the story of most of uh, Iberian uh, colonies. Thank you, Jorge. Um, well, I, actually, I, I, I'm participant in a panel of Spanish-American abolitionism in a month in Paris online. And I hope to be participating in something that exists. <laughs> you know, regrettably, I'm not, I'm not going to be traveling to Paris. I'm stuck here in California. <laughs> no, no, there are cases. There are cases, uh, as you know, Jesus has his work on it. And there are some cases in, in Latin America, in particular in Spain during the... the no, Jorge, no Brazil. hold us. There is abolition in Brazil. Am I we about have, so we have Brazilian scholars. Who oh, of course, but that. I'm, talking, I'm talking about the Spanish Empire. Yeah, 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 but you say Latin America, like, uh, uh, but no, no, in Latin America, Brazil. In Brazil, and then in Spanish America, we have judicial abolition. Yeah, Brazil compare, if you compare Brazil with, uh, let's say, Cuba at the same time, 19th century, we both are thriving as a society. Cuba is still a colony, while Brazil has some resemblance of some form of democracy with some form of free press that, allow, that allows this to happen. But that didn't happen in the Spanish Empire. At least so now, in the 19th century Cuba, which was the only, the only serious slave society in the Spanish empire, actually the only place that Spain, Spain owned with Puerto Rico in America. Well, now you see that you have to have a lot of patience to do an edited volume. <laughs> yeah. And I think that perhaps one element to be considered is the fact that the, 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 the time, the, the timeline of this abolitionist movement that in the United States already emerges at the end of the 18th century in England and so on, but in places like Brazil, it's late. Then you are talking about the second half of the, the, the 18th, uh, of the 19th century. But uh, I agree with Alex that it perhaps is, is too strong to say that there wasn't, um, uh, especially if you consider uh, the, case of, um, the case of Brazil. Uh, but let's see what Elliot has to ask to us. Let's go. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief um, because I know that I think we've gone over time. And, um, I'm in great company of historians, and I'm not a historian myself. I'm, I'm more of a linguist, but um, I've, I've delved into much of your work, and I love this book. Um, so thank you for uh, hosting this talk. Um, I just wanted to mention, I put a few things in the chat because uh, much of what is on Colombia is digitized by Colombians. Um, so the government, um, the Archivo General de la Nación de Colombia is the, uh, mostly digitized. It's um, roughly equivalent to digging through boxes. Uh, it's not easy to find things, even if you have the exact um, citation. Yeah. But you have to have the catalog for, for the section of uh, enslaved people and, and people of African ancestry in general. Well, you don't necessarily, you can go through the whole thing. You can actually go, uh, so some of it is not in the Negros y Esclavos part. It's, it's in uh, a particular region. Uh, sometimes it's not even the region where the document derives from. <laughs> so you got to go to Cauca to find about Choco. You got to go to Antioquia to find about, you know, Choco. Um, so there's quite a bit there. Um, so I would just mention that and also uh, the question about um, people of African descent um, doing uh, this type of historical work. Again, um, Colombian historians like Orian Jimenez, uh, Sergio Mosquera, 
Um, they're doing exceptional work. Um, most of that is in Spanish. Um, they're contemporary, but they've been doing it since the 1990s. Um, and, and they're, uh, you know, based in Colombia. Um, and, uh, you know, I can show those resources. If anybody wants, you, you find me, send me an email. But at any rate, um, you know, there's, there's wonderful resources in the Archivo General de la Nación de Colombia, but there's also sort of these crowdsourced, um, you know, efforts by Colombians, you know, young um, historians uh, at, at, you know, undergraduates uh, or, 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 or master's students or even in the independent researchers going to the archives in uh, Popayán. Um, you can find these things in archives that you would never expect to. So in U University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, the Popayan papers, 28 boxes worth of I I incredible documents. And you could just walk right in as a member of the public uh, and, and check those out. Uh, Indiana University in Bloomington has uh, some really fascinating documents too. So um, th there's stuff everywhere um, and it's not necessarily you know, where you think it might be. <laughs> it shows up all over the place. So uh, that's just my two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Adriat. Do we have one last question? Uh, I ask then if the co-editors, Sabrina and Alex, would like to add some final thoughts, if there are things that perhaps uh, you would like uh, readers uh, to, to get from the book that were not explored or uh, I'm not sure if, um, if you have something that you would like to add. Okay. On, on the issue of, of abolitionism, even the, the last chapter of the edited volume actually address that uh, from an inverquist at work on what is known the first published uh, abolitionist uh, writings that are even before the Quakers, you know, uh, which were Spanish uh, monarchs. That doesn't mean that these movements, to be a movement, has to be as the English movement or as the US movement. Things that are different are different, and things that are the same are the same. I know that doesn't sound very smart from my part. But I, what I'm trying to say is that we have to make the categories more complex to be able to accommodate uh, Spanish American realities. Okay. Thank you, Alex. I don't know if Sabrina has uh, something to add. Um, no, I mean, just to, to wrap up, to thank everyone for uh, joining us today. I know it's, uh, you know, late in the semester for those who are wrapping up semesters and quarters. Um, and this has been a very fruitful discussion. Um, and I've been, you know, jotting down notes uh, in terms of thinking about future projects. So uh, thank you all for uh, joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. And we would like to, I would like to ask a question, quick question for the two of you, to Sabrina and to, to Alex. Uh, what uh, could you tell us uh, if this kind of project that you did here, if there will be new developments uh, in terms of uh, your involvement in this kind of project, uh, any new database that is coming, any new edited book, any new monograph, uh, what is the future of what uh, was done here with uh, this book? Then I would like you perhaps to, to add some, um, uh, just some thoughts uh, to, to guide us to, to what is next, uh, because I, I just don't want to leave people with a sort of a pessimistic feeling that there is so much to be done that nothing was done uh, and that um, and I know that you are doing a lot then I just want you to to continue on that <laughs> I think una rosa negra I have a black rose just in case you know for to that no actually <laughs> uh, it's a great issue Anna thank you very much for pointing to that uh, with Sabrina and with scholars in Mexico uh, and other parts also in, in Peru and as, as well in Chile, uh, we're thinking about doing a kind of network of research regarding internal slave trading in the Spanish America, particularly the Black Pacific, meaning doing some kind of connected research that points to the internal markets of enslaved people that Sabrina works, but other people who work in Guadalajara, 
in eh, Lima, in Chile, in Valparaíso and, and uh, Santiago de Chile, and the exchanges of, of, of that. Because there is a, a lot of research uh, going on from even archivists within municipal archives there uh, that get very isolated and we would want them to put them together. Uh, again, from the entirety of the Black Pacific, from Mexico all the way to, to Chile. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm in a panel of, of the Mexican Economic History Association next week, that mm -hmm. half of the panel of, is on uh, the traffic of enslaved Africans within uh, Mexico as well. Wonderful. Uh, I don't know, Sabrina, if you want to add something. Yeah, and because you, then we are uh, want to know also about your your book. That I don't know if you are going to have a slavery archive book club at that point, but who knows? <laughs> it would be wonderful if you could host me. Um, yeah. So this is the chapter in this volume is just one small piece of what would go into the book. Uh, my first book, which is um, really a, you know a micro history, uh, a social history of the black population in Oaxaca. Um, for the second book project, which is, you know, what Alex is kind of um, alluding to and talking about the bigger uh, project, which I'm not sure if I can share this, but we've talked a little bit about involvement with Slave Voyages as well uh, for future collaborations. But for the second project, um, I thought a lot about um, the movement of people within this broader region of Central America, right? Literally connecting Mexico down to Peru. Um, and I talked about how Pablo's chapter you know, reminded me of some of the, the initial ideas I had for uh, the second project of looking at colonial roads as new spaces to conceptualize uh, blackness, um, to understand African descended populations, uh, both free and enslaved um, during the uh, 17th and early 18th centuries, right? And, and I'm so glad that Elliot pointed out the, the important work that local scholars are doing, um, which in many ways we can work off of, collaborate with them. Um, and so this isn't necessarily completely new, right? because there are plenty of other um, scholars working on many of these topics. But, but I have uh, thought about that as, as moving toward the second project um, down the line. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And you are looking forward to, um, to, this, uh, to, to your book and to the projects that you are developing. And I hope that people who uh, read the book or who will read the book or who are watching this, uh, they will be uh, enthusiastic to develop uh, research um, in this, uh, this region. And once again, you are going to finish, and I just want to present again the book, From the Gallons uh, to the Highlands, uh, Highlands Slave Trade um, Routes in the Spanish Americas. And this is a book co-edited by Alex Baruch, uh, David Altis and Dave DeWitt, published by University of New Mexico Press, a co-edited book that has uh, very interesting chapters uh, on the Spanish Americas, uh, the slave trade to the Spanish Americas. And before we close, then I, of course, I want to ask um, to just to say thanks uh, to Vanessa Holden and also to uh, Alex Hill, who are here with me. Uh, presenting uh, and co-hosting this book club now for an entire year. Uh, it, we had fun, but we are not done yet. Uh, we are starting a new year that at least is going to be a new semester, let's say that way. Uh, then on June the 30th, uh, we have a new uh, session, a new year that is going to start for us. And the first book that we are going to have is slave trade and abolition, gender, commerce, and economic transition in Luanda, uh, Angola. Then this is a book by uh, Vanessa Oliveira and it was published by University of uh, East, uh, Wisconsin Press. It was just published uh, last February. And then we are, are moving back to Africa to a port um, on, um, in uh, West Central Africa. Then you are all invited to join. Go to uh, slaveryarchive.wordpress.com, uh, register there. Uh, on you to, to, to attend on Zoom. 
And this is going to be a Wednesday, June the 30th, uh, 5 p.m. Otherwise, thank you all who came today. And I hope you have a great summer. And I hope you find time to come back, join us uh, in at the end of the month. Thank you. <laughs>